clean cities. So rank them that way, okay? As you also know that you're going to pick some of those top niches and you're going to fill out these second pages. And as you're listening to the discussion, there's nothing that says you can't add to these sheets and add comments as you're hearing the, dis the people's comments after this. And so we want you to do this first just to stimulate your thinking, but you can also add to that afterwards as you're going through it, okay? And um, please don't forget to fill out the demographic information at the bottom so that we know that your name is optional. Appreciate that, but name is optional, okay? Just a few things. Um, because we have such a big group, our dialogue is really going to be, you're, so you have four standing mics here, and you're going to have to go up to one of those mics to make a comment. Um, and that's just because of the size of the group and the, and the room on that, okay? And I'm, my job is to move things along and to keep things uh, going quickly, uh, to keep time. And, you know, as I told the first group, what, it's not easy to keep time because when you're tracking minutes, there's sort of two, three kinds of people in the world, those who can count and those who can't. And the first group didn't think it was funny either. So, okay, but the point is, all right, anyways, the point is, is that I may cut some of the, I, I may hurry you along or cut some things off, and I do that with all due respect, just so we can get as much of a discussion going and as many people having a chance to speak. So what's going to happen is I'm going to ask you to fill out worksheet, the first page, just that worksheet, page one, and then we'll have like 20 minutes of talk, then you'll fill out those second pages, and then we'll finish, have the last uh, part of the session Again, more talk, and it's sort of more of a, we'll try to have it as dialogue as possible, but it's really from those mics, okay? So, did you have any? If anybody has any questions about the niche, the niche or the opportunities on the forum, because uh, we discussed them earlier today, but yeah. I'm just wondering if... Yeah, you're right, my mistake, my fault, sorry. See, when you get to be managed, you have these senior moments, and that's... So here's the definition of the niches, just to remind you, okay? So there's cars, trucks, buses in dense areas. So the idea here, the niches are sort of targets, targets for clean cities efforts, that it would uh, be, provide a focus. And so what you would do is you target the owners of these, perhaps pr primarily these fleets or vehicles that are used for commercial purposes delivery, cabs, you know, all of that, that are in these densely populated urban areas and that are primarily used a lot there and that they're driving a lot, they're stopping a lot. That's, you know, okay, let's, get, let's target those. That's one niche in that, okay? Then there's the cold climate areas. These are, you're targeting the people who can buy these vehicles in these cold climate areas. And the problem is, is that some of the, the uh, vehicles, the electric vehicles, the battery doesn't really uh, work uh, for that because it gets cold and it reduces that. So you really would probably want to target them with to get some kind of a plug-in uh, electric gasoline combination on that. But there could be a strategy, you know, a focus on that group to try to get them to purchase these combinations and switch over to those, okay? That's that niche. Major metropolitan non-attainment areas. These are vehicle owners uh, in the areas that have these air quality standards and, and there's pressure to meet those and if their area is not meeting those, then there's some, um, maybe some incentives on that. And so you could say, gee, that would be sort of the angle we're gonna go for, is those people, non-attainment, potentially incentives, and you know, that's what we're gonna go for. That would be the way of doing the niche. Uh, new metro edge 
outer suburban construction. Now here you're not targeting people who will buy vehicles, but you're targeting the builders, developers, the owners, maybe the city planners, those people who are sort of had some control or design control over the construction of like residential garages, parking lots, commercial buildings, multi-unit dwellings, commercial residential garages, you know, and if you sort of hit those people and get them to lay the groundwork for the infrastructure, it's a, it, that would be a niche. That's a much better way to do it than to try to do it after the fact. So that would be a, a, a niche to focus on. Then there's just sort of the general passenger vehicle worldwide, uh, na nationwide, where, you know, primarily owned by people who are not in the city specifically, but, you know, just driving along, you know? Soccer dads and moms, that kind of thing. We use it for commuting, for errands, you know, taking kids to sports, that kind of thing. That group, big group, sort of. And then finally, workplace charging. Again, you're not, char you're not targeting people who would buy vehicles, but you're targeting businesses who might be persuaded to put these charging stations in for their employees on that. Okay, so these are the niche areas that were identified. Rate them, add some more that you want. Okay, just take a couple minutes. I know you probably finished it. Take another minute or two to finish up, and then we'll start the comments, okay? Just, do you mind, just wait for two minutes. Or do you have a question? Clarifying question? Yeah, absolutely, go ahead. Um, I noticed that on the vehicle types, it talks about plug-in electric and hybrid electric, but it omits fuel cell electric. And my reason for asking the fuel cell electric question, it could, it could change someone's ranking question on this, but this is a five-year update. And I don't know of any automaker that really is pushing past 2020 in terms of having that technology available in the marketplace. Some as soon as today or launching in the eight state MOU stage, which is a 3.3 million vehicle potential by 2025. Okay, good. So just I'm a clarifying let our question. Expert Dan, uh, yeah, answer that. Yeah, the fuel cell. Here, try this. Okay. The fuel cell gets uh, mentioned in the white paper, and, and uh, the reason there's not an emphasis is that it, it is a strategic plan for five years. There will be a limited rollout of the fuel cell vehicle, so this is a national level discussion. It, there's room there for another niche, so if people think that that's an important niche over the next five years, then that input would be greatly valued by uh, Queen Cities. I, uh, but uh, we had to pick five or six, and uh, the, the uh, marketability and uh, the, the extent to which OEMs, we think OEMs are gonna be committed to full national uh, sales of the vehicles had an influence on our thinking about what to put in there. Thank you. Okay, just going to remind everybody that the main purpose is to uh, inform Clean Cities uh, strategy. So uh, I may ask you uh, a question of sort of what is the, if you have a comment, what would be the takeaway for Clean Cities if it's, if it's not clear strategy on that, okay? So, um, I'm going to open it up. We're going to have uh, 20 minutes of this, and then I'll have a hard stop. We'll finish. We'll go back, finish, you know, do the second, and then you can come up. And if you were left standing, then you can sit down, fill it out, come up, and you'll get preference for the second round, okay? On that, again, comments for strategies or questions of Dan. You were first, sir? Go ahead. So um, two things. One, I would just start with... I would ask you to reconsider your, your, your focus on the workplace charging, because what you said was it's not to focus on the person to incent them to purchase the vehicle, but the business to maybe put them in for their employees. But actually what you are doing is you're trying to give an incentive to the actual right. person to buy the vehicle. So right. there's a dual purpose there. You're, you're trying to install Fair infrastructure. Enough. But what, So point. my name is Rob Gibbs. I'm from PSENG, New Jersey's largest electric and gas uh, utility. Um, we rolled out a very innovative workplace charging program, both internally but also for outside businesses. What, we, what we're doing is, for businesses in our electric service territory, 
that can uh, commit a minimum of five plug-in electric vehicles, either through their own fleet or through employees, we're giving them free level two, um, uh, level two uh, electric vehicle charging equipment, and it's all networked through the Hydra R10, or Liberty Access Technologies. Um, so we're trying to incent people to buy the vehicles because all of our research and data has indicated that workplace charging, at least in New Jersey, is the gap in the marketplace. California may be different because of their geogra geogra uh, geography and climate and all the other things, but in New Jersey, it's the range anxiety that people have. They don't know if they can get from A to B, and so we've been focusing very heavily on the workplace charging. So the takeaway for Clean Cities that I would ask is that one of the things in our program that we found was a barrier to greater uptake by businesses was yeah. when we came to them and said, hey, here's the program, they were like, oh, that's wonderful. We don't know if our employees have electric vehicles. And we said, well, ask them. And they said, well, how do we ask them? Oh, so the issue is that companies have no clue right. how to approach their employee base to, to inquire. What, the question that they ask is, do you have an electric vehicle? It's the wrong question to ask. The question is, if we provided workplace charging, how likely would you be to consider purchasing an electric vehicle? So they have no clue. So maybe the takeaway is for uh, DOE or Clean City is to come up with a template survey that companies can yes. internally, uh, you know, distribute to their employees to it's see. Well, it, it's it's um. Yeah, I, I've seen it, but it, you know, again, companies don't. Um, it's it's part of a broader package, and so companies want to get down and dirty real fast. Yeah. They don't have time for this kind of stuff. So if there's just some more specifics around the survey itself, that would be very helpful. I mean, yeah, we created our methodology own methodology and right because we created our own, and it's been very helpful. We're getting sure. more uptake, but. It's just, okay. it's one of the barriers. And, and you're right, I was a little bit too um, focused on the charging, and it is really also about the employees uh, convincing them. Go ahead. Um, over here, I'll go, I'll, I'm going to go back and forth. Yep. Oh, I'll actually the last one, okay. okay. Uh, now, I'm, my name is Bruce Brim, I'm coming with Go E3, uh, yep. fast electric car charging stations on the expressways. I, I really think you're missing a major par part here when you're not including uh, connecting routes between cities. Most people don't like to buy electric cars for commuters. Americans don't buy cars for commuting. They buy cars for freedom. And I, I, I would suggest that you're missing a major thing by connecting routes across the cities between things. Good. So that would be like, in a sense, you're suggesting an, another niche. Yeah. A focus on that connecting yeah. route. And, and, I, the, and uh, I would actually second that. I, I, that was, I was going to suggest a niche around DC fast charging, yeah. you know, corridor DC fast corridor charging. Corridor DC fast charging. Okay, good. And, and so the focus would be a dual focus, again, on trying to get people to buy the vehicles, but also on who to put that in. Me? <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Great. Um, I'll get back to you. I'll go over here first. Yep. Um, additional niches include retail, um, residential, whether it be multi-unit um, multi residential or even individual re um, residential, in addition to fleets. I would, you know, you can't put workplace charging in there and not have all their counterparts of the types of charging people do, whether it be home right. charging, retail. Got it. Okay. Good. Uh, hi. Yeah, I'm Jay Friedland from Plug in America, and yeah, the two niches that I was going to suggest was indeed DC fast charging corridors, and then what I what we like to call L1 everywhere, which is that people charge at work, but they also primarily charge at home if they can. And I think that um, there's a recognition that L1 is um, you know particularly for plug-in hybrids, but also um, you know something in excess of 50% of the Leaf uh, charging sessions are done on L1. So I think that there's very very interesting data that says uh, L1 for multi-user dwellings and for uh, a variety of different residential situations, particularly in dense urban areas, that makes a big difference. So I think it, the L1 is a, is a niche and okay. something that clean cities can really have a big impact on as uh, with the DC fast charging corridors. Now sort of the you, sip and go, sip, sip and gulp. What do you think about the uh, retail? I think retail is absolutely another place where L1 makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, hi. Uh, my name's Claude Masters, um, Florida Power and Light, and I just kind of wanted to throw out an idea to the Clean City Coordinator. It's a business model that I think makes sense, but I haven't seen anybody adopt it. So let me run a scenario by you, and I'll use a couple of examples. So the, the dreaded range anxiety always comes up, right, and people look for the magic bullet to solve range anxiety. But 
in the business world, uh, let's use a scenario like uh, you're flying into Orlando for vacation, you're going to see Mickey Mouse, you rent a car, nobody rents plug-in electric vehicles, right? So you rent a car, you go to, when you get there, they say, I guarantee you when you go to the Disney Orlando Resort that there'll be a plug-in station there for you to charge your car at. If you're gonna go to the b baseball, football game, you know that there's a charging point at that station. You go to a select uh, number of outlet malls, which they have thousands of in Orlando. You go to the outlet mall, there's a charging station there. And guess what? You no longer have range anxiety, right? The problem is, is I've never seen anybody put all those pieces together and find yes, interesting business Yes, they do. On partners. Plug Share, they have that. Okay. Well, yeah. my point, though, is, is like where I live, for example, when I travel with my plug-in electric vehicles, I go to hotels and they like look at you like you, you came from Mars, you landed from Mars when you ask where my charging station is. Now, there are a few of them but they're typically hidden somewhere where you can't find them. Even the people that work there don't know that they're there. So my point is, is that clean city coordinators could help facilitate those opportunities in their area. Right, and to think of a more holistic charging infrastructure rather than workplace versus this versus that. Great, okay, yep. Hi, uh, I'm Allison Gillette. I work for NRG EVgo. And unless I'm missing something, I would suggest we take the cold um, climate off the list just because, um, so I work, ironically, in our Georgia market and our Vermont market, so one of the warm cities and one of the, or one of the cold, warm climates and cold climates. Georgia works so well because they have extremely high incentives and have extremely high um, network capabilities with EVSEs. Vermont doesn't work at all despite um, how progressive everyone is in Vermont because there are nearly no OEMs selling cars in Vermont. There's no EVSE infrastructure, which we're working on now. Um, so I, I think it has nothing to do with whether it's warm or cold okay. and is really more about what the incentives are and the availability of the vehicles. Great. Good. And, and those are great comments, uh, positive or negative about a niche. That helps either way to help us focus. Okay. Over here. Yep. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rob Graff, the manager of the Energy Evolves and Climate Change Initiatives at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, the MPO for Greater Philadelphia. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Dan and his team on putting together what I thought was a tremendous document that very thoughtfully laid out the appropriate uses for various types of vehicles. I mean, I think one thing we often get confused about is sort of treating electric vehicles as monolithic. You know, oh, it's an electric vehicle, therefore it needs plug-in infrastructure. Uh, you know, everywhere. Charging, I mean, if you have a uh, vehicle where you carry your own uh, ability with you to make it continue to move once the battery's dead, like a uh, plug-in hybrid of some sort or an extended range electric vehicle, then the whole charging infrastructure debate completely disappears. Or if you have a vehicle with an extremely large battery, like a Tesla, it disappears in most cases. So I think we have to be very careful about appropriately looking at uh, that. I encourage everyone who hasn't done so to read the full paper because it, it's the first, it really lays that out thoughtfully. Um, the, one of the thoughts I had was um, actually about thinking about multifamily housing uh, off street, uh, for people, off street parking for multifamily yep. housing and figuring out some way to get at home charging there because what we know is that 80% of the people use, um, use at home charging for their primary charging. Right. Uh, and the other is looking into, at some point, sort of dedicated charging of some sort for urban dwellers uh, who do not have off-street parking. I don't know quite what that would be, but I think oh. the key is if you have, oh, right. you need to have, if you own an electric vehicle and you want to really get electric miles out of it, you have to know exactly that you can park it, plug it in somewhere. Yeah. Whether you know you have dedicated charging at work right. or dedicated charging at home, you have to know that you can plug it in somewhere, and you also have to have the confidence that if you don't have electricity, you can go further, which is why I'm pleased to see that this uh, uh, supporting sort of vehicles that carry their own uh, auxiliary, either generator or auxiliary engine with it. So thank you. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, I have two additional niche opportunity areas right. that actually I think uh, both are opportunities to respond to some problems that are existing and starting to come about. Um, one of them is resiliency and the fact that electric vehicles, electric trucks can become areas of almost many um, power stations that can export power. And also, the I don't know exactly what category to put it in, but also thinking about 
uh, possibly demand management, accessing as backup power for facilities, connecting to the grid for um, storing renewables and yeah, microgrids and uh, that all into one. I don't know how you want to put that into a category, the person who's taking notes. Um, and then the second thing was uh, actually a little bit of a response to your uh, comment about how Americans want a vehicle for freedom and not necessarily to go from point A to B. I think we are seeing a little bit of a shift with the millennials and there's this conversation that they do don't actually want a vehicle, they just want to get from point A to B and it's not necessarily the same kind of, you know, our daddy wants me to buy, wants to buy me a Mustang when I turn 16 sort of situation. So how can electrification fit into that mobility area that's changing and actually also responding to Delaware Rob's um, comment for urbanites is connecting uh, mass transit, using electrification and, con and to use that as connecting mass transit points and also car sharing and how it can be fit into all of those different areas really well versus some of the other types of technologies for vehicles that are out there. Like you're saying, put charging <clears throat> stations in park and ride lots? Right, put right? charging stations in park and ride lots, put them, you know, target car sharing companies and say Got this it. can be what part of your um, fleet makeup, um, you know, give them, it's also response to the type of consumer that is using that, that car sharing, they, you know, they want that vehicle oh, okay. only for the interim to get them to the next destination that will, they can sit somewhere and be on their smartphone while they get taken or driven or in a train to their next destination, right? They don't really want to drive. Maybe there's an opportunity to put in some of that like driverless car sort of stuff too and electrification in there, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I just think when another niche opportunity is with, uh, is with dealer engagement in the communities. So there's been a lot of work to engage the dealerships better on their ability to sell the vehicles, understand them, understand how they fit into the community. Uh, and so I think that's just a place that, uh, that Clean Cities could play a role is, is bringing dealerships together, working with the, the sales staff, et cetera, on the actual vehicles. And then a second point, and it's actually to the charging station one, is uh, it's, it's, it's really wayfinding for the charging stations. So there's actually apps that exist, but there aren't standards for communities. So if they have charging stations all over the place, that doesn't mean anybody does know where they are. So you know we have, we have gas station uh, uh, signs that might be somewhere, but there aren't similar things that exist for EV stations in most communities. So I think that that might help uh, people be more aware of the, where, how many charging stations are around and how to find them. Yeah. Bob Moffitt, I represent uh, North Dakota. I'm the coordinator there. And I'm keeping cold climate states as my number one because I think if we just give up on them, if we just say there's nothing we can do in cold climate states, uh, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, and nothing ever happens. Um, I cover North Dakota, but I live in Minnesota. Both states are pretty cold. Minnesota is managing to get things done both in uh, getting vehicles and getting infrastructure. There's no reason it can't work in every state. And frankly, I think it makes a great story. If you can do EV in North Dakota, you can do EV anywhere. Thanks. Uh, let me ask you a quick question. Do you think that the approach needs to be different for, uh, I think the, the approach to everything in North Dakota needs to be different. <laughs> <laughs> but the approach I used yesterday on the Hill uh, as I talked about alternative fuels, I said everything I'm talking about today is made in North Dakota. Everything is a local product, and so is electricity. And you know, I said for certain areas, um, the urban areas on the east side, and also military bases, college campuses, inside the fence airports, those are perfect applications for EV. Okay. Certainly there's a niche in North Dakota for it too. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rob Gibbs again. Um, I noticed in the paper, I did read a section about uh, battery technology and how it may progress in the future. And I, you know, I guess the, what I would ask is that you maybe survey the OEMs because you know, Tesla has the 200, 250 mile range car. Chevy just announced the Bolt, which in 2017 will come out 200 miles. When we talk, you have to be careful about when we talk about infrastructure, what infrastructure needs to go where, because charging be, uh, behaviors from consumers will change and fluctuate depending on 
what their car is capable of. Uh. So when we talk about putting fast chargers up and down, you know, the, the, the coasts, um, you know, in all, or level two charger, which is very expensive because it's $5,000 per unit on average, we have to be careful that those don't become what in the utility world we call <laughs> stranded assets because yeah. if people just say, oh, I've got 175 miles left on my charge and they drive past the infrastructure, it just sits and it's a waste of investment. So I would just ask that, you know, you, you look at the trends going forward. I know that, you know, the OEMs are very close to the best with what's coming out, but we need to consider that because even as a utility looking to do EV infrastructure investments, I mean, you know, we saw what PG&E did in Kansas City Power and Light. psc and is looking at the same stuff, but we're not, we don't think the market's there yet because all those charging behaviors are going to change. Okay, good. Now, I'm going to give... One more comment, and then the people who are standing, I'm going to ask you to sit down and fill out page two in a minute, but then when you come back up, you'll be first. Okay? So, one more comment. Yes. Hi, I am Cassie Powers at Georgetown Climate Center, and I just wanted to speak to the education for a moment. That's, I think that there's an opportunity for the coalitions to really focus on providing education both to the dealerships and to the consumers on a couple of areas. One, we've been talking about the limited range of the vehicles and how there's not enough infrastructure, but there's a whole segment of electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, that can make it from point A to point B without the necessary infrastructure right now as that market continues to grow. And so, so often consumers don't know that plug-in hybrids are available, that it's okay. just a battery electric. They don't know the difference. And beyond that, when we're talking about the battery electric vehicles, um, there's really also an opportunity, I think. I just lost my train of thought, damn. Um, I think that when it comes to the battery electric vehicles also, I'm going to have to sit on it and come back. But for okay. right now, plug-in hybrids, we need to continue to talk about that and push that. Okay. All right. So, um, again, choose a couple of niches. Uh, three would be great, but if you have two or one, uh, your top niches and answer these questions specifically. Now, these are the activity areas of clean cities, these four here. And again, for the niches you choose, you're going to look at these areas and see which of these areas are really relevant and then talk about what that should accomplish. So if you think, you know, you have this um, non-attainment areas and that's that and you say, coalitions and partnership, collaborations and partnerships are really critical for that, then you would fill that out. But if you don't think training is critical for that, then you don't fill that one out. Just don't waste your time. So what we'd like you to do is make sure you fill out what do you think, at least, what you think that needs to accomplish in that niche, this activity, and you know who needs to be at the table for that activity, kind of who needs to be there. Uh, involved in that. So if you could fill that out, then you can add whatever else you want. Again, we're trying to streamline it so that you don't have to fill out every box on every page and you don't have to do every niche. But if you can do multiple niches and a couple of boxes for each, that'd be great. And then at the bottom, don't forget this last box of, you know, what can the local coalition do in that niche, okay? All right, just take a minute to finish those up.
Okay, let's begin the discussion. Um, again, you, you can talk about the, still talk about the niches on the first page, why you think so, they're good, some are good or not. Any others you wanted to mention? But also, we want to expand the conversation to some of these activities. So do you think some of these activities are particularly useful to a particular niche? We'd like to hear that. In, a gen in sort of a real broad sense, you could say that the first page is more of what should clean cities focus on, and then the second page is sort of a how. How should they approach that area kind of a thing. So it's sort of a general what and how. So any comments in that regard would be really useful or questions on that. Um, and the people who were up before, if they want to come back, that's great. They can get first shot. And if you've thought about your second part, we want to hear that too. Go ahead. J.J. Brown with Via Motors, who does plug-in hybrid uh, pickup trucks and suburbans and vans. The, um, uh, we, we've talked to uh, like military bases, universities, folks, and larger corporations who are also working on things like solar and wind, and they're displacing um, they're displacing wholesale. They're they're trying to compete against the wholesale electricity that they used to get, and it doesn't work that great economically in most cases. Um, but a lot of those same organizations are fleet owners. Yeah. Now, if they were to focus those um, renewables, either wind or solar, into their fleet of vehicles that are plugged in, either plug-in hybrids or plug-in vehicles, now they're competing against gasoline and diesel, which is very economical. So um, by just helping them make that connection and, and make decisions based on that, they can go from a very uneconomical model that sometimes they're being forced to go after to something that really brings synergy with better vehicles and so they're getting lower emissions on their vehicles and on this, plus now they are actually saving money because electricity is cheaper than diesel. It's not cheaper than six cent kilowatt hours, but it is much cheaper than diesel and gasoline even at these prices. So to help coordinators help, help them understand these, the symbiosis between plug-in vehicles and renewable electricity right. um, is something, a lot of them just haven't made that connection. And to have someone come in and, and they can they can, we can really tap in to what some of these organizations are being forced to do with vehicles and over here uh, on, the, on the electricity side as well. Yeah. No, I, I like that. That's to target some of these really big potential users, but to give them a model, a new model that puts some of the pieces together that they might not think of. And it might yeah. take some creative thinking yeah. on our part, but. Yeah, That'd and it doesn't great. have to be that creative because yeah. plug in and you got it. It's yeah. taken care of. But to, to plan around that because a lot yeah. of them are being forced to do or, or choosing to do both. They, ha they need to improve their fleets and they need to improve their... Right, and if they don't make the connection, that's just a lost opportunity. Exactly, yeah. Great. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, it's Ann, uh, Ann Taswell, North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center. I would like to um, encourage you all to consider expanding the niche market for cars, trucks, and so forth in uh, densely urban areas to include neighborhood electric vehicles, electric motorcycles, and e-bikes because in dense urban areas maybe you don't need a full-size vehicle and they are still running on electricity. Uh, and. Uh, also, I guess as far as how to implement that, uh, it's like a lot of cities have sustainability offices and as well as chamber of commerces, you could have some kind of like a plug-in challenge, uh, something to raise awareness that are done in urban areas that have kind of air quality problems as well with their sustainability well, offices. Let me just ask you, who, who would you want, if you wanted to get something like that going, who would you need well, to work would, together? Uh, you would get large urban areas that already have a sustainability focus, like where I live in the city of Raleigh. They're a very sustainable city. They're mm -hmm. early adopters, so could get them on board with um, kind of doing, a, uh, I guess, a workplace charging for businesses to get more um, charging in, in those cities. But in terms of so, stakeholders in the area, uh, who would you want to get involved in that? Well, you need to get the air quality people, the clean cities, the, well, the sustainability folks. Okay. And, and businesses, yeah. Chamber of Commerce too. Okay, great. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm Bill Williams with Telephonics. We make uh, level one and a level two commercial charging stations. We also have worked with the Hydro 10. We've got over 140 being placed at a utility in Southern California. And it's an exciting project. 
Um, the other thing that the, the community is in the, the general public now all know about it. We're past the tipping point. People know what an EV is. They also know that hundreds of millions of dollars have been lost by bankrupt companies mm -hmm. that have tried to make a network. Um, so we've got to overcome some negativity. We also need to now get out of the early adopter phase and realize that you don't have to be a tree hugger to like an EV. We need to let mainstream businesses not be scared by $5,000 chargers. They need to know that an outlet like Plug in America so happily promotes, a, an outlet's a good beginning, and then a, a level one like Clipper Creek or Air Environment or Mine Telephonics are within a, a $800 to a $1,500 range. Um, very simple level one. I have become the airport charger, if you will. We're at Denver. I've got another one going in West Coast of over 42 chargers. All level one will be in a West Coast airport, and it will be free complimentary charging, no data. I think we've created data anxiety in this industry. Um, and 18 of those 42 chargers will be for employees of the airport. So I strongly support the workplace charging challenge and the facts that have come out of that is great because people that can plug in at work are 20 times more likely to buy a plug-in electric vehicle. So as, as money rolls down the pipe through Clean Cities coordinators, I think being very efficient and effective with the outreach plans to get plug-ins at workplace is the first and most effective way, not at a library, not at Walgreens, where cars are already parked, what a concept. The other thing is that there's dirty air sections like the San Joaquin Valley in California. We have seven out of the top 20 dirtiest cities there. So we've started a um, San Joaquin Valley electric car partnership, electric vehicle partnership of eight counties. And we're really trying to take truck mentality and teach them about the advantages of driving electric vehicles. So the other thing that I wanted to comment on is that I have a dealership outreach program. Dealerships already have people driving an EV. Those are our grassroots beginning. Those are the evangelists. Mm -hmm. So let's talk to where they work and go from the bottom up. And the other idea I have is the schools that will put in just two charging stations. I come out and speak, and we've turned it into a curriculum. So they can oh. also study solar alternative fuel, they can figure out renewable energy, but now they can see their teachers driving a vehicle and how fun it is. And I'm talking third or fourth grade, because anybody, wow. any, any, anybody talking about solar to these kids, they're already bored with it. They know about that. Um, but Clean Cities has got a great opportunity to do this outreach, the ride and drive events, getting butts in their seat, but do it at a workplace and really get the effect going. But you've got to have the dealerships involved. And, and we've got to get the local businesses to see the advantages. And there's a lot of surveys, there's a lot of data and research out there. Just want to make sure people know there's enough availability of information out there already. Okay. So. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. The Joaquin Valley, that, is that what you... That, yes, yep. San Joaquin Valley. Is that like a non-attainment area? Would that fit into that niche or is that... We're the worst in the world. It's the okay. worst in the world. Um, you've got to... Well, and we use, I, I've always said, you know, there's, there's eight counties there with four million people. That's eight million lungs. And we need to talk about smog. We don't just talk to the general public about smog anymore. It's still dirty air. I don't care if you believe in global warming or not. Dirty air is dirty air. So we've got to get this sustainable business of ours to be more sustainable. So a general business person can say, hey, I've got, I've got eight dental locations and a couple of my uh, assistants and two of my doctors have plug-ins I'd like to put them at all ten of my locations but then they go to this one of these large charging companies and get a quote for five thousand dollars a piece and a four hundred dollar contract and a service fee it's like it's a coffee pot plug it in it doesn't have to be hooked up you know they're gonna drive 20 miles so the replenishment of that on a, on a leaf would be six kilowatt hours well how much do you pay per kilowatt hour it's predictable. Mm -hmm. So just charge a $5 a week fee. Mm -hmm. You don't need all this connectivity. And in some places you do, but I'm just saying it'll only work for 90% of the population. Okay. So okay. you did say that that non-attainment areas is a good niche to, yes. to focus on. Yeah, good. San Joaquin okay. Valley. I mean, we're, it's an uphill battle, but we've, yeah. we've got the clean cities involved. 
We've got the, the Air Board involved. We've got small businesses involved. And our outreach plan will be workplace as well as infrastructure, you know, the really plan where it's going to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Good. Thank you. Um, I would like to second the uh, recommendation earlier that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles be added to the portfolio. I think it would take, taking account of the next five years, it would be a mistake not to do that. I think that if you look at the things that Clean Cities does, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles need all of those, and uh, that also Clean Cities brings something to this effort that the other players don't. Uh, and, and is missing. What uh, is I that? could understand saying uh, it's too early when there were no commercial vehicles in the marketplace and when there were less than 10 stations in the country, but that is changing rapidly. Uh, the, and there is a commercial vehicle in the marketplace and there will be more, and if you look five years ahead, I think uh, it would be a mistake to say uh, we shouldn't be doing something here. Yeah. And, and I've heard it said that fuel prices might be going back up. So. In the next five years, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, just one general quick comment. So in the discussion about electric vehicles and equipment, um, I want to remind people about the uh, capability of stacking technology. So what I mean by that, all of our, our aerial devices, our bucket trucks that we've electrified, uh, when you get out to the job site, you know, they're running not only the aerial device on electricity, but the HVA system as well. But on the way to the job site, they're burning B20 biodiesel. And when you look at the emissions profile, the subsequent effect is about 75 to 80 percent less tailpipe emissions for those vehicles. And there's more and more equipment out there now, work equipment, construction equipment, that's becoming a hybrid model. And so, real quick, I'm not pressing or selling or advocating for anyone, but uh, this fall there'll be a, a IQ show, the International Construction Utility Equipment Show in Louisville, Kentucky, the end of September. It's a great opportunity to see one of everything in the world that is built, and I'm not plugging the show, I'm plugging the, the industry and the knowledge and the technology. I love the show. But the point would be is for those of you who don't get out and get to travel and see a lot, it's the only place in the world where you'll be able to see every kind of bucket truck, every kind of construction equipment in the world, and you'll see a lot of the newer advanced technologies there. So that helps with the educational aspect. Is that a new niche, or is that part of a... I don't think it's new. I okay. think it's just something that people need to think about, you know, that okay. kind of gets lost at times. Most right. people think of technologies of being mutually exclusive of each other. Okay. So my point is, is that, you know, just think about where there's opportunities where people are buying a hybrid type vehicle that you may be able to run that on a biofuel as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yeah. So I was kind of thinking of this on, as, at a whole level, yes. not just specific things and how you guys might be able to fit into what I'm going to call the EV movement. Um, and I thought that there might be two areas you guys could help everyone out. Um, obviously, we don't need you to make cars. The OEMs are making cars. We don't need you to make the charging stations. These guys are making the charging stations. We don't need you guys to install them. We and other companies are installing them. But I think where you guys could be the most effective for all of us is first as a storyteller. Um, my company, and I'm sure most of people's companies in here um, don't have the bandwidth yet because we're so new to be able to tell a really effective and engaging story, even though this is a very engaging story. Um, so it might be great if you guys could come into different areas and talk to the destinations where we might put EVSEs, talk to the dealerships, which is going to be hard because dealers don't want to listen. They want to go out and sell cars. We've had a terrible time trying to train dealers. Um, and also uh, talk to maybe new construction areas, like you're saying, on the edge of cities. Um, but most importantly, and I'm sorry for people who were in the last session with me, because I'm going to echo what I've already said, but uh, we, we spend a lot of time and money uh, doing demographics research. And as someone said earlier, our current demographic in this industry is early adopters and crunchy granola green people. Um, that is very quickly and already shifting to millennials. Um, and one thing that our organization needs to do as a whole is shift into the digital marketing space, the mobile marketing space. And one thing that might be great for you guys, especially in city centers, um, is partnering with new 
companies like Uber, like Lyft, that are already, ha already have right. a really great um, reputation with millennials and they will help tell the story for you and they already have the digital infrastructure for you. So that was the first thing you guys could do. The second thing that would be great is if we could somehow have more incentives, either on the government level, national or federal government or state government, but someone was talking about incorporating wind and solar and electric all together. Mm -hmm. So we're part of NRG Energy, which does the whole gamut of energy things, um, but we're also trying to figure that out, how to connect solar and wind with electric vehicle charging. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard because it's so much money and we have so many partners that want it. And there are solar powered electric vehicle charging stations, but it just costs too much money. It's not there for anyone. So maybe more incentives and things like that would make stuff like that work. Okay, good. But can I just ask you, some of those things seem like local, local coalition issues. Some of those things are, seem like the national uh, clean cities, the, uh, the DOE clean cities. Is that true or is, do you see one or the other or are they? Um, I think all of it could be on the national scale, but it needs to be in, okay. I think it should be national programs that are in implemented on the local levels. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Yeah. Hi. I, uh, <clears throat> again, I'm Rob Graff from the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission in Philadelphia. I actually came down to Washington, D.C. Uh, using an electric vehicle, uh, and I think it'd be interesting to talk about that a little bit. I came on Amtrak, and then I changed to another electric vehicle, the Metro system. Uh, and uh, at home, I walk to an electric vehicle and take it to another electric vehicle to get to work. Uh, and I think it's, this goes back to the comment that was made earlier about uh, integrating different modes and even if you had to use a gasoline vehicle to get part of the way to transit, and then you took transit rather than take an electric vehicle all the way uh, to your destination, <clears throat> uh, I don't know. I, I know that currently it seems as if the uh, Clean Cities program is limited to electric vehicles that run on roads, or to vehicles that run on roads in general. But there's a lot of energy savings that can be done in petroleum removed from the transportation system by using, by thinking of transit as electric vehicles. So I'd just like to think about that as, you know, so getting people that yeah. last mile one way or the other yeah. is, is really a good way to, uh, to, to increase the use of alternative fuels and transportation. Hmm. Good, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Barry Woods. Uh, I do sales with Clipper Creek, uh, who, who does level one and level two charging stations. I'm also on the board with Plug in America with Jay. So I'm not going to reiterate Jay's points, which I agree uh, heartily with in terms of additional issues, the, the charging corridors with DC Fast Charge and the use of level one incentives. Um, but I also am in Maine, and I want to just reiterate in line with my compatriot from North Dakota that there is a cold weather issue, especially with the battery electric vehicles, and that's something that I think it would be good to keep on the list of items to address. Um, the real reason I'm here to talk is uh, to, to ask if we could develop, if Clean Cities could consider developing a tool that could be used more on the policy side. Because what we see are uh, tremendous uh, boosts in states that provide some form of tax incentive or point of sale rebate. And I mean, uh, I mean I, I, I'm familiar with a couple of studies that are out there, one from the University of California, Berkeley, that talks about how vehicles, uh, electric vehicles that are defraying the cost of gasoline and, you know, insert money into the local economy, the petrodollars are not being exported. I think uh, as we see more and more states that are starting to actively engage um, both in terms of their regulatory policy and also their, you know, their, their tax policy, um, having resources that prove how, what the economic impact is of driving these vehicles. Uh, especially in terms of jobs and the local economies and so forth, I think is a really um, critical area, and uh, it's one that I think we could uh, be w could well serve, you know, incentivizing, creating more incentives across a broader array of states. So, uh, so you're saying focus on the policy in terms of the incentives, but at the state and local level? Yeah, I mean, when, we're, when you're arguing with the taxation committee about why the state should carry a, you know, should perpetuate an existing tax credit or, or create one, it would be helpful to have economic data that shows that the okay. state is actually not going to be losing money, it's going to be gaining money in, the local, in terms of the local community multiplier by having additional money inserted into the economy and, and, and all of the other various, you know, various uh, areas. So uh, it would be an interesting tool. I think it would be helpful. Yeah. So. So in a sense, you're saying try to come up with the value proposition Correct. of an incentive for that 
community, that local government, I, local or yeah, state government. Interesting. Correct. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, Cedric Daniels, Alabama Power Company, part of the Southern Company. And my comments are somewhat similar to the storytelling comments that were made earlier, but a little bit expanded from that. So this idea of education is something that's vital that we can definitely use some help with. As many of us know, it's really difficult and tough to, to educate with the complexity of plug-in electric vehicles. We've seen the array of uh, uh, acronyms, et cetera, out there, and so we're constantly struggling to, to uh, provide that education. So an education, though, that would not just be focused on the millennials, but also geezers like myself. I like Wiz, Bang, Bang Power, Star Wars movies, and all of that, too. Uh, we, we find with every type of product in our industry that we work with customers on, whether they're residential customers, commercial and industrial customers, we have to make it fascinating. We have to make it unique. We have to make it concise. And so we have to keep up with those trends. So my message is to ask you to put some energy and some, some money and some economics into the solution to make something that's fascinating and educational to target particular types of customers, particular types of niches to assist us, and then we can help move this market further. Even if you can't place it on television or place it on certain types of national media, provide it to us and maybe we can utilize it in our local circumstances or our states, et cetera. But that would be very, very vital and very, very important to us. So crafting the right message, a compelling message that's focused on a particular audience or a broad audience? Is yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm talking about, as we know, the great Walt Disney. You know, the greatest nation in the world is imagination. As you know, he provided edutainment. And that's really what we have to do with this in order to get the masses to accept and adopt and even consider. And again, I'm speaking of not just residential customers and a dense population, but people throughout the community, even in rural areas, can benefit from these technologies and especially our commercial industrial customers who are also in some of those rural areas. So that would be fascinating and very, yeah. very helpful to us. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Ed Lovelace from XL Hybrids. So the, the ones that uh, you have targeted, really the only one that directly addresses commercial vehicles is the first one. So I, I would just advocate for making sure that that one's part of the, the primary portfolio because obviously the medium duty, heavy duty sector consumes about half the energy that the light duty sector does, but it's much fewer vehicles with much higher utilization, so there's a real opportunity to, to make an impact by having clean cities still focus on that commercial sector. Thanks. Okay. Do you think the, is there a size that's more appropriate for the electric vehicle in the commercial sector? Well, um, you know, I tend to think with the heavier vehicles, and, you know, obviously there's lots of vocations. Um, obviously, limited mileage ones, you can go full battery electric, but there's a lot of vehicles that plug-ins and charge sustaining hybrids in the commercial sector are, you know, excellent choices with no impact to operations. And, uh, you know, certainly if you look class two up to class eight, you can look, of course, at how many vehicles are sold in each of those classes to target some that make sense. Okay, good. Yeah. Tagging on to what Ed just said, I'd, I'd like to ask you to consider dropping hybrid electric and just use hybrid because there are a number of different kinds of hybrids out there. There's a kinetic hybrid, there's hydraulic hybrid, there's electric hybrid. So excluding that, and there was nowhere else for me to bring this up, and I know, you know Fuel Cells was talking about this a little bit too, but excluding, excluding that doesn't make any sense, especially in the, that first line that Ed was just talking about for commercial vehicles. Okay, good. Okay, come on. This is the best area. This is the exciting area, the electric vehicle area. And here, Clean Cities has to really come up with a strategy. So, come on. All right, I have so another comment, comment then. Yeah. Uh, I, and I can't remember who it was. I was trying to look it up. And one of the deputy directors of the Department of Energy spoke at a conference in L.A. a couple of years ago. On, I think it was one of the EV conferences out there, EV26 or something. Uh, and he said he encouraged the use of the term all electric vehicle for all electric vehicles, AEV, because all electric vehicles that we've been talking about today, all the plug-in hybrids, they all have batteries. So we're talking about a battery electric vehicle as opposed to an all electric vehicle, it confuses someone. 
If you say an all-electric vehicle has difficulty in cold weather, that's a true statement. If you say a battery electric vehicle, and you're talking about a plug-in hybrid, or an extended range electric vehicle, or a hybrid, they don't have problems in cold weather. You may not get as many electric miles, but they can go where they're going. And I think that as confusing as this area is, I think talking about all electric vehicles as all electric vehicles, AEVs, as the Department of Energy recommended publicly, uh, would be a, a, a change I'd like to see implemented. Because I think it would make it edu easier for people to understand the differences. But if you, can I just ask you, yeah. if you're saying all electric vehicle, isn't that ignoring the differences or am I missing what you're saying? Well, an all electric vehicle is a vehicle that only uses electricity to propel itself. Oh, okay, got Whereas it. Whereas a uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle is a vehicle that uses electricity for some of the got time, it. or, uh, but it's also a battery electric vehicle. They all have batteries, right. except for the fuel cell electric vehicles. Got it. Okay, good. Thank you. So that's instead, of ba instead of battery electric. Yeah. Good. I'm going to add a little bit to what he ended up his statement with. Why change the way people do things? Why are we looking at these electric vehicles as a different car? They're not. People are habit-driven. This needs to be approached from a consumer-based usage. As you said, don't put them behind garbage cans. I mean, or places people can't find them. I know that very personally, okay? The, the issue is we're trying to treat these as they're something new. They're not. We need to promote these as a, just another vehicle, integrate with the other places they're providing energy, and call these, instead of gas stations, energy distribution centers, and make it all yeah. about consumer usage. Don't try to make it something that's not. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, ben Farrow, Puget Sound Energy in Western Washington, Clean Cities. Um, in addition to a number of the great market acceleration things laid out here, I would encourage us to also think about how we maximize investments that have already been made in terms of you have the vehicle tax credits that have been out there for a while. Uh, in our market, those vehicles are starting to come off of lease or be sold private consumer to private consumer and making sure that those additional private consumers know about electric vehicles and, and how to use them to leverage what Cedric had said earlier about making sure everybody knows really help maximize those federal investments over time. The second thing is in charging networks. Um, it's been mentioned that the charging network mo business model has been challenging for a number of people. Uh, don't forget that those connections and infrastructure are still out there. So making sure we're using those to maintain networks as opposed to just build new ones. Okay. That's a good point about the networks. When you do need network, we do need the um, open the OCCP standards, which is if Time Warner goes out of business, another cable company can come in and operate it. So that's very important that these networks aren't um, exclusive in operation because then we might get caught and we're making a five-year plan. Let's hope these charging companies are still in business in five years and haven't left us high and dry with a <laughs> bunch of locations that are inoperable. Yeah. Um, one thing I just want to bring up as an opportunity because it's more of a policy um, Talking about level one uses, which uh, Dan came up out of his study in white paper, thank goodness it was mentioned that it does apply. Plug in America has supported it. The incentives out there from the local energy commissions and the Air Resources Board and even LEED to qualify with plug in stations have all been specified as level two. Now, I understand they didn't want to give people credit for putting in a bunch of outlets, but the language just needs to say a commercial level one station would qualify in, with a J1772 plug. And it would be a huge incentive to open that up because where level one can be used, it's also going to uh, lower the need for panel upgrades. It's going to, the demand response uh, needs may not be needed in some of the smaller applications. Many solar uh, panels have been put on commercial companies and school districts again. Those would have no problem with the peak demand issues, especially with a bank of 10 level ones instead of two or three 40 amp level twos. So I just want to make sure the policies have kind of been one sided and we've got an opportunity to maybe make a change. Good. All right, thanks. Steve Russell from the Massachusetts Coalition, buried in snow in Boston. <laughs> yes, I'm just lucky to be here. I had to climb over a lot of snow banks to get here. 
What I really, what we've talked about here is, is the different niche markets. And one of the things that really only gets m mentioned in one is the non-attainment areas. And, and what we're really talking about here is a zero emission vehicle when we talk about battery electric vehicles or close to nearly zero emission. And I think that's got to be a message that gets out there, that we forget about that. It's also a lower cost vehicle. And I think when we start trying to get vehicles in the hands of low income people, this is a great niche to look at. So I think in Massachusetts, we have a consumer rebate program going on that's been very popular. We, we've dumped two million bucks in less than 12 months to consumers and they, they, they ran for the money. It's, it's very interesting. So. If you're in an area, encourage people to drive that clean vehicle. And I also support the fact that we need to do the hydrogen fuel cell. We need to get that on the, on the docket here because they're coming. You know, I think yeah. we've got some infrastructure issues, but you know, we can get over that, just what we've done with electric. So I say clean vehicles and petroleum okay. reduction is really the message we have to have here. Thank you. Okay. I'm with the Greater Washington Clean Cities. Uh, and just want to make a few comments uh, regarding the uh, working with dealerships. I think, uh, as a couple of studies have shown, the UC Davis study, Consumer Reports, is that the um, first opportunity for a potential buyer to have a bad experience historically has been at a dealership. Or a good experience depends on the level of uh, information that uh, that consumer gets, and that could be a consumer, it could be a fleet manager. Uh, but forming, I think one of the things that clean cities do best is to form relationships and and partnerships. Uh, and we've begun to form relationships with our uh, dealership association. And we have already announced that we're starting a dealership training program. We're going on site to provide the information where it's biofuels or electric or um, natural gas, propane, et cetera, on site directly with the sales people. Uh, because I think we, we, use, we lose a good opportunity to increase sales if these people are turned off by the ex sales experience. And typically, uh, it's not the sales people not having the time or the energy or the commissions. There, there are a lot of reasons because uh, you're dealing with uh, a business model that historically has not included alternative vehicles. You mean the salesmen in the or salespeople in the dealers? The salespeople are not equipped to really sell electric vehicles. Uh, yes, I mean. And that's, that's the point, I'm, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'll just refer you to the uh, UC Davis study. It has been documented, studies that actually uh, reports went into dealerships and documented the bad experiences that many consumers had. If you go in and have a bad experience, the probability of you buying that vehicle yeah. of going back, you know, is diminished. Yeah, and, um, but, uh, and I, you know, what I'm saying, that can apply to you know, a single consumer or a fleet. Yeah. You know, you have to be able to answer questions about uh, range anxiety. You have to be able to answer questions about federal, uh, state, local incentives. Uh, those are very important pieces of information to have when you're trying to make, make the sale and you're looking at the total cost of ownership and not just the sticker price. Right. Uh, I just encourage more, uh, and we found that uh, our deal association, uh, which covers Maryland and D.C. and uh, Northern Virginia, have been more than willing to engage with us on this process, and, and I think wow. that we can do a better job of it in other locations as well. Okay, good. And building off of Claude's point of partnerships with the dealerships or utilities or other stakeholders, I think that there's also an opportunity for the coalitions when they're having those conversations to share information about a renewables rate that might be available in the area. So many utilities offer their time of use rates 
for a renewables for PE, EV owners like in Minnesota, or they offer a renewables rates in general that customers can sign up for. And so if we are going to have these vehicles be zero emission vehicles, there's an opportunity to also give information about how consumers or businesses or whoever can sign up for those rates as well so that the vehicles are also charging with clean energy. Good. Okay. Is that, can I just ask you, is that, that similar to the comment about sort of can, does that dovetail with the comment about connecting the dots of saying if you're, if you've, you're, you've got renewables on site and you've got a big fleet of thing and why not connect that? Is that some of that same picture? It is part of it. Yeah, that's, that, that's an opportunity for on site to have a renewables infrastructure that can go directly to the vehicle. But even if you're not putting in a solar panel or putting up a turbine, you can also just usually sign up for a green rate with the utility and that way you can get oh. energy that's going to your house or your vehicle or whatever that is relatively clean. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, Don Francis, Clean Cities at Georgia again, and Georgia has something very similar where I can buy uh, blocks of premium green energy and it's solar. So when I get criticized about my coal-fired car, you know, I have a, an answer. Uh, and that's another one of those educational pieces because there's not a lot of uh, owners adopting it. But in my situation, in our situation in Atlanta, the critical piece is, in my mind, workplace charging. Those employers that have put in workplace charging have seen an explosion in the number of vehicles. Uh, Coca-Cola has 75 charging stations and 150 employees with cars. Southern Company, about 200 to 300 employees. But the big employers who haven't done it yet have hardly any at all. Uh, so we, we, we're seeing a direct correlation between workplace charging and a mass adoption of the vehicles. Uh, we have a law firm downtown that one of the lawyers got a leaf. We put charging stations underneath his building, and now nine of the lawyers have leafs. Huh. And they drive them because of the convenience. You know, they're, they're smart. Yep. They're not, un, you know, not, they're all well paid, so they could be driving things other than leafs, but they all kind of adopted this, and it, what drove the situation was the input of workplace charging. The, ve the vehicle manufacturers are building product. The star charging station manufacturers are building product. What we have to do is create a situation where you take every negative off the table. And one of the big negatives is where am I going to charge it at work? Particularly in Atlanta, we talk about the cliff dwellers, those who uh, live in high-rise complexes. They're generally close to work. Uh, they don't need to charge at home. They can charge at work and make the vehicle work for them if we have a little bit of public infrastructure spread around. So in our situation, what we're trying to focus on is expansion of workplace charging and everything else will happen. Good. Okay. Hi, Britta Gross from General Motors. Um, maybe just some thoughts about dealerships. Um, and I hope I can be succinct about this. There's, there's room for everybody to improve. There's room for me to improve and everybody in here in the way we communicate, talk about something as complex as environment and energy and economic studies that we do here for this market to grow. Um, so there's room in the dealership um, network to certainly make improvements and there are always stories of things that don't go right. Um, and I think it's perfect to suggest that you partner with dealers and you reach out in community, you bring them into those ride and drive events you have and and you, you try to show them that someone cares in the community. Because the real challenge is, is that when a dealer only sees someone interested coming in the door every four or five months for an electric vehicle, they have to almost quickly retrain themselves. Oh God, what was that training I saw six months ago? And so we're, we're giving them basically an impossible task, which is being able to answer all of our, every time we show up and quiz a dealer, because we're all you know, dealers locally knowing what's going on, we're actually wasting their time and they're, they sort of understand that they, they are being caught off guard and then when the consumer shows up, they don't really, you know, they're just not prepared. The only thing that really fixes this issue is getting consumers to flock to the doors of the dealership so that there's enough repetitive business, there's a lot of, you know, they, they get really expert at talking about the talking points, about negotiating the deals, about explaining the pluses and minuses, and finally they get so 
so educated, they start talking about time of use rates with the utilities. But it takes you a while to get to that point. Yeah. And they just don't do this business every day in some areas. In those areas where the consumers have shown up and are at the door, those, those dealers excel. And they've got not just one guy trained on staff or gal, they've got three, four, five people any day of the week that knows that business. So I think it's completely appropriate to say, let's reach out to dealerships, let's get them in, bring them in the fold, get them out to those events, show them that you care, show them that there's a, there's a building interest base. But we ha the, the, don't think that you don't have to do consumer-driven outreach yeah. and education. That's what's going to change this market, I think. Okay. A room for two more comments. Okay. And then could everyone also hand their um, worksheets that they filled out, sort of pass them down to the, this end of the aisles? Go ahead. Um, I totally agree. And I've got to tell her, I'm on my third EV, and it's a Chevy Volt. So um, I'm very happy with the Volt in California. A lot of information as some champions at each dealership that sells the most EVs at that dealership. There's always one person that stands out. A lot of their inter information is done on the internet and they literally walk in knowing what the price is and they may have overcome their own yeah, objections, right. we hope. But back to the coal fired issue, if anybody wants to get a non-sales presentation, I've posted a coal-fired response to all this negative stuff about EVs being more dangerous. And people forget, Elon Musk is even quoted in it, um, that it takes electricity to produce a gallon of gas. That electricity could be put in the electric car instead. Yeah. Delivering that gallon of gas takes more gas. Getting it into your car and burning it again, each step creates CO2. So the electric drive and eventually the hydrogen, because it's going to be an electric uh, a motor, it is an electric motor, is four times more efficient, even if it's the worst case scenario, coal-fired electricity. Mm -hmm. So if you or any, anybody in this room ever needs ammunition, look me up on LinkedIn. I'll give you free presentations. I've got them on SlideShare, and I'll share sure. anything. I'll create them for you. Um, I'm in this 24 hours a day, and it just irks me to have somebody have the wrong information, and yeah. that's the real problem. So, Good. I just I wanted to build on the comment of uh, the psychological benefit. I, I know workplace charging is really important, but the psychological benefit to consumers to being able to get where you want to go is pretty strong. So. Uh, we in North Carolina have worked with uh, the uh, DOT to include in highway signage under lodging and food yeah. supplemental signage that lets the, the driver know they can yeah. get, um, you know, a, a charge at a restaurant or at a hotel. But I, I would encourage DOE to work on the federal level to get this included in, um, you know, with federal uh, signage guidelines because most oh, yeah. DO, state DOTs will follow the feds naturally. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much for that uh, discussion. Um, we're going to reconvene here at 3.30, which is in about five minutes. So you've got a chance to get up and, and stretch your legs, or you can just stay there. And again, please um, turn your, uh, there are people around collecting those, but if you want to bring them up here, that would be great too. But we need your worksheets. Bill. Oh.
First in line now, huh? No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting down. We can uh, take a seat. Uh, we can start our wrap up for the day. So, so we're coming on the the very last part of the day, and. Uh, First of all, I want to give a great big thank you to all of you for showing up and um, 
you know, we had the, the written and the, the discussion process, but I think everybody that wanted to get up and talk said something, and we were able to collect a lot of good information on paper that we'll be evaluating over the next uh, several weeks and months. And uh, by the fall, we, we plan to have a new Clean Cities five-year strategy document, and within the next uh, few weeks, we will have a meeting report on this meeting up on, on the website uh, where you also will find all the papers and the presentations and all the information uh, pertaining to this particular strategy meeting. So again, thank you so much for your participation. That, um, I also want to thank the people that helped. There was a lot of people involved in helping to pull this event off. So I want to give a really big thank you to uh, our contractor, New West Technologies, they uh, really helped out a lot with, um, with all the logistical stuff here around the building. It's not easy here at uh, DOE. We have sort of an antiquated building and a lot of old technology, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's not as easy as uh, handing it over sometimes to a hotel, so I uh, really appreciate them. We, of course, we have a lot of security issues at DOE. Um, so, so thanks to New West, uh, particularly Ellen Bourbon and uh, some of the other folks that, w that uh, worked on this, Peter Haywood, Richard Bogas, and um, I'm sure, and Tom Schmidt, sorry. Uh, and then uh, the staffs uh, that are doing the papers, uh, the, the meeting report is being done by C2ES, that's Nick Nigro and Dan Welch, and uh, thank you to them. They came here and took notes and uh, observed what's going on, and they'll be working on the meeting report and um, sustainable energy strategies, that's Dave Gelman and Jill Hamilton, a lot of you have worked with them over the years, have a lot of uh, great experience, and they'll be working on the final strategy document, incorporating you know, everything you said here into sort of a high-level report that we can use to um, create um, something to inform our management and, and our um, Clean Cities program over the next five, uh, five years and be able to um, uh, put the resources where they're, where they're best needed. Um, so again, you, you've made all of that possible. I want to thank all of our lab presenters, um, Marcy Rudd Warpy, uh, for helping us. She w did a major part of the organization on the part of Argon National Laboratory. Our lab presenters today, they're listed uh, in the bios, and the facilitators. Um, now, speaking of the facilitators, I am going to invite um, them to come up, and they are going to report uh, on the sessions just at a very high level what the major takeaways were from all six of the breakout sessions. So each of them were in charge of two. So they will uh, discuss the two sessions they were involved with and, and give us sort of the immediate takes on uh, what were the major things discussed in their opinion, the major trends discussed, and, and some issues that came up that they think are important. So uh, we kind of let the editing up to them. And we haven't pre previewed any of this, so it's kind of unscripted. Um, so we'll let them do that. Um, and then following that, we have a special announcement. Uh, it's a Clean Cities announcement, uh, official. Uh, and Dennis Smith is going to close us out with that um, announcement. So stick around. And we will call up uh, the next, um, the first facilitator, I guess Fred uh, Hansen will have you come up first. And by the way, somebody left a nice pair of glasses So if uh, under a seat, so if you or if, I think it's a female. Um, if you're a female and you lost your reading glasses or your glasses, please uh, come up and get them at the end. Thanks. OK, I'm going to talk about the sessions on natural gas and electric uh, drive vehicles. And one interesting thing that was um, similar across both sessions is Neither session laughed at my opening joke, and so I, I probably not very humorous people in those <laughs> sessions. So, but anyways, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not going to go through that again. No. Okay, um, for the natural gas, um, also both sessions, the comments were. One of the things we emphasized was to make them, focus them on uh, helping clean cities strategy, informing clean city strategy. Both, both uh, sessions, the people who commented did a really good job of, of keeping it focused towards helping clean city strategy. In the natural gas, um, one of the things that I thought was very interesting is there were uh, a lot of comments um, and suggestions that were 
sort of cut across the niches. And so one of them was, one of the examples would be the maintenance garages uh, and uh, for these natural gas vehicles uh, are a significant challenge and having a place where you can get it repaired and that's part of the cost. And so that's something that, that cut across all of the niches within the natural gas. And so that was kind of an interesting thing. Uh, another one similar to that was the education of the people who are peripherally involved with uh, natural gas vehicles. So uh, people like uh, EMTs who might come to an accident that has involves a uh, natural gas vehicle or a station that provides natural gas fuel. And, um, you know, are they educated for doing that? You know, to how to deal with that? And someone suggested that maybe there's a, you could have a phone app where if you see a symbol, you could push that and then the EMT person can get, get that information right away on what to do when you see that symbol kind of a thing. So that was another example of something that cut across. Um, another one was focus on deployment, um, both the infrastructure and the vehicles and sort of a pull through strategy. And that really uh, is important, that focus on deployment. Um, leveraging the existing infrastructure was another idea that came up. The example was, you know, you have, um, a fleet that has uh, that provides uh, fuel for its natural it in the morning and or it it just it serves its own vehicles in the evening and then could serve public vehicles during the day and so that would be a way to leverage the infrastructure in that and then lastly branding these uh, natural gas vehicles and uh, the branding around them and explaining what these you know what is a natural gas vehicle and, and portraying a good picture of that. So those are some of the themes that came through. I'm sure that uh, there were a lot of others, but those were the ones that just stood out to me. Um, in terms of the electric vehicles, um, one of the things that uh, came through, very interesting comment, uh, repeated, was forming a relationship with the dealership. And this was, again, outside of the niches that were presented was like, oh, here's another target in a sense is forming a relationship with the dealership. And um, we had multiple kinds of perspectives on there, but one perspective from a car company was, you know, these, the people who are selling these vehicles, they, if they get one person coming in every six months to, to inquire, you know, it's sort of, hard for them to keep up on it and keep enthusiastic about it. But if Clean Cities comes in and partners with them and they know that there's enthusiasm in the community and support in the community, that can help. So in any case, dealerships could be a really good uh, target uh, for some partnering on that. Another thing that came out similar but was a good story and the, the sort of overall messaging around electric vehicles is, is uh, another important thing. And, you know, it is a complex area. There's a lot of different kinds of vehicles uh, out there. And some of the, the languaging we use isn't exactly uh, helping. And so in that sense, that kind of messaging, but also getting some good stories so that people can use those stories to uh, spread the word, that would be helpful. Uh, another one was uh, this, the idea of workplace charging as a leverage point, and that kind of expanded in charging in other places where vehicles are normally parked on that and providing that, but workplace charging as a real uh, leverage point, and that was one of the niche areas that, that was uh, highly mentioned because that then creates the pull uh, uh, for people. Um, Lastly, what I came up, found was interesting was the idea of connecting the dots with the electric vehicles and renewable, uh, renewable energy. And I, one suggestion was the idea that you have maybe big fleet owners that also are installing uh, renewable energy sources and hey, 
they might not be thinking of connecting those two and using the renewable sources to charge the vehicles, and maybe that's something of connecting the dots that can be done on that. Um, but that said, those were my themes, uh, but both groups, I thought, really did a nice job in, in focusing and coming up, focusing their comments. So, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Brookman, and I did the biofuels group. We had a lively discussion, mostly because we had to cover both E85 and biodiesel, <laughs> so that was a lot of content. Um, and we did this in a rather structured way. We talked about the priority markets for each of these fuels. And in the case of biodiesel, the top vote getter was school buses. More than half the individuals in the room thought school buses were a high potential niche, followed by work trucks and sustainable commercial fleets, followed by mass transit, followed by off-road, which would include construction, mining, ports, and, and et cetera. And then lastly, retail. Um, all of these presented opportunities. Uh, school buses uh, driven by reducing impacts on children's health, and many of the older vehicles in fleets, uh, and biodiesel would be the simplest, lowest cost option for immediate impact. Uh, the, the long lifespan of work trucks were noted, and just high volume and large fleets, so a lot of fuel use, fuel selling potential. Mass transit, again, lots of fuel use and multi-year contracts, and fuel contracts provide the avenue for other fleets to buy biodiesel, so there's some crossover there. Off-road, once again, these vehicles uh, they don't have a lot of choice for a lot of other alternative fuels, but there's a, a lot of fuel use. Um, and frequently centralized fueling stations, so it's a good play for a uh, biofuel station. Uh, where clean cities can help with biofuels. Um, recent examples of success is always helpful. And model contracts for fuel purchases, and they noted those in Dallas-Fort Worth and some other places. And then moving on to the, I'm told I have three minutes for each of these. <laughs> moving on to the E85 top markets. Uh, general consumers was, was the highest vote getter. Um, 16 million plus vehicles already on the road. We just need to get the vehicles that are out there to use the fuel, which can be a challenge, many speakers noted. Um, automakers have the incentives for now to sell the vehicles, but increasing need to use the fuel to keep the cafe credit. Local governments, including police, <laughs> Uh, lots of fuel use, lots of idling. There's a, one thing theme that came out in the discussion, a lot of opportunity for some of these technologies for complementarity, for building off each other to achieve uh, fuel use savings and uh, reduce uh, all aspects of cost. Uh, state governments was another top target market for E85. And um, uh, commenters noted that many are already buying flexible fuel vehicles to meet APAC, requ APAC requirements, but don't have E85 available or operators understand the advantages of using it, not fully. And then finally, federal feuds, fleets. Um, where clean cities can help with E85, better education of consumers retailers and fleet operators, including why it's important to use the fuel. Infrastructure needed, grants would expand availability to additional users, increasing use. Uh, addressing price sensitivity issues, blender pumps may help, or buying directly from producers. Coalitions can be a link between producers and retailers. Product coding for credit purchases, still an issue for tracking fuel purchases, needs a national solution. And there were some cross-cutting issues that emerged in the discussion, both biodiesel and um, uh, E85. Dealers, sales, personnel training needed. Hard to get salespeople off the floor, but they need to be trained. Sustainability education needed. Um, in both sessions, they thought sustainability was a great window, a great avenue, a great play to um, introduce the topic. Strong, stronger partnering with OEMs at the national level will, will benefit the coalitions. Better marketing and advertising through digital and social media, that they talked about that as an emerging trend and something that especially targeting and working to market to millennials. 
uh, needed to happen. And coordinators need an incentive to promote biofuels as they do with other fuels. And that's the report on E85 and biodiesel. And propane. This was easier because we had more time. <laughs> um, the top vote getters with one, uh, the best or most promising opportunity or niche again was school buses. Um, and school buses, they were talked about the inf incremental costs of buses and infrastructure are low, propane is widely available. As in rural areas, many schools already use propane for heating, so the fuel source is already there. And uh, school budgets are going down so they can save money on propane buses. Clean cities can help with school bus contract contractor through national partners program, serve as a source of data, help make connections, and the need for more case studies to counter bad experiences 20 to 30 years ago. Some key points surrounding propane. Propane is primarily a fleet fuel now. Savings when the fleet contract directly with fuel providers. Uh, talked about differences in pricing and how pricing can be challenging, finding the right price can be challenging at different points in the distribution chain. Domestically produced and widely available is propane. Many propane dealers will install infrastructure at no cost in return for a fuel contract. And um, the commenters encouraged everyone to work closely with PERC, um, in, in ensuring that certified kits are used and installed properly. And then on pickup and delivery, that was another natural niche. High fuel use vehicles, many propane suppliers available. And for paratransit, lots of government funding available for vehicles, heavy vehicles, lots of fuel use, idling. Many passengers have respiratory problems, so cleaner fuels are a real benefit. We covered a lot of ground in these sessions, and that's my report. Thank you. My name is Diane Russell. I'm with the Institute for Conservation Leadership. And I had the pleasure of working with uh, two different sessions uh, that often intersected as we talked about it. The first was on fuel economy. And I think one of the overarching comments that kept coming up is how diffuse the targets are. Um, and so the strategies were less about markets and niches, as the presenter said, and a lot more about opportunities that kind of ran the gamut. We began by looking at what the best opportunities were, and I think everyone agreed that expanded outreach and using the advanced auto technologies that are emerging were the two top pieces. I think there was a lot of light and heat and interest around some broad ad campaign. I think sometimes with our issues, things go deep, and a lot of the clean cities work is very local, but there was a sense, especially on fuel economy, that having something that was broader that other folks could tap into, whether it was working with the ad council or other kinds of communication technology, uh, that that broad consumer and getting at decision makers would really be supported by that kind of expanded outreach. In addition, the advanced auto technologies really fed in then to a whole conversation around technology in general and how that would help to drive fuel economy. And I think whether it was kind of the next tier down interest in access and creating access through the mobile devices and upgrading capacity around that, or trying to crack the used vehicle market, which is harder. Um, harder to rate, harder to communicate about, um, harder to label, all of those pieces was uh, a part of it. Consumer decision making is really one of the things that drives um, fuel economy. And again, there was this interesting byplay in the conversation around how technology supports consu good consumer decision and also how it can actually change uh, consumer behavior. And, and that kind of then yielded this very interesting uh, two, two different levels of conversation around both decision making, so point of purchase kinds of decision making that consumers make, which is often driven by dollars, as we all know, um, and acknowledgement that sometimes, especially in terms of decision making, 
that work isn't as high as the emotion that goes around buying a vehicle, um, especially for general things. The dollar driver often works better with unified fleets, as, as we all know, and so getting at that level of decision maker seemed to be really important. <coughs> the second level in terms of uh, how consumers are, are controlling this is their behavior as drivers. And there's a lot of interesting conversation around how do you change people's everyday driving habits? Um, and I, I saw the themes that came out of that, no silver bullet there, but a lot of it is about giving feedback, uh, sometimes enhancing competition, um, or providing rewards, whether that's dollar or other kinds of pieces. Two other things that uh, were noted was the need for more research. I think especially when you're talking about changing consumer behavior, around um, either decision making or behavior behind the wheel. Um, there's, there's, a, there's some data out there and there's work that could be done to aggregate that, but there's also probably some new research that needs to be done to understand how consumers actually behave and what's motivating them. You need that before you then go to message development, as we all know, um, but really trying to dig down and understand what motivates the decision making, but also what motivates behavior change when it's successful uh, were both two important pieces that came out of the discussion. Really excellent job. I appreciated everybody's uh, comments in that. The second session that I had a chance to facilitate was on idle reduction. Um, that one, it wasn't like there was cream that rose to the top in terms of the opportunities. I think there was a real appreciation of how all of the targets that were articulated are important. There are opportunities there, but there wasn't a, a great deal of consensus about, yeah, definitely go for that, that particular niche market. Um, in the conversation, there was an emphasis on trying to find low-hanging fruit. And Low-hanging fruit could be around just how much petroleum do you save, but it also could be in terms of places where you felt like you could either change uh, the technology again, change the equipment, or change the behavior. And I think generally, and this may be a little bit of my bias too, but I think, I think generally there was a sense that changing the technology was easier. And so looking at um, opportunities where you could change the technology and it wouldn't affect the driver, or, and the driver wouldn't have to do it. Or you could make a change in a fleet and then have a captive audience with the drivers where you could both have the technology change but also instruct them in, in an organized sort of way. I would say, in, Again, in terms of low-hanging fruit and bang for the buck, eventually the conversation kind of moved to the heavy-duty trucks. And there was really interesting conversation about how hard it is to get at that market, especially with the Clean Cities model. Clean Cities is local, long-haul trucks cover North America. And so how do you go, go at trying to make those changes stick? Um, and also, light duty is easier to work with because the fleets are often um, easier to identify. It's easier to equip and train, as we talked about. But there actually may be more bang for the buck, except it's probably a little hairier challenge to get at it with the heavy duty trucks. Those, that conversation led to uh, two specific, um, I would say, observations and maybe even hopes. Uh, one observation is that there may be some opportunities here, especially on something like long haul trucks, for more cooperation between DOE and EPA. That some of the coordination and the policies, both around what's being focused on in both agencies, but also what's all also really happening, could be uh, more tightly coordinated. And then there was also an acknowledgement that there's short resources to do, especially the big, hairy, kinds of issues like long haul trucks. Um, the current grants may actually be, or the current grant systems, both in DOE and EPA, may be a little too directed um, to be able to get at some of the bigger, more challenging issues. 
So that was idle reduction. Okay, well, we heard some great things from you, some great ideas, uh, a lot of good questions. One of the most frequently asked questions that I got in the hall was when are you going to announce the awards for the, uh, the last round of grants that we had? Uh, I wish I could announce that today. All I can say is soon. Please stay tuned. We think that's going to be real soon. Uh, but uh, I think something else that uh, is sort of late breaking news. Uh, as of uh, this afternoon that I would like to uh, tell you about is uh, we've also had feedback from you in recent years to say, look, how can we have more input into the funding opportunities when they do come around? Uh, so we've, we've tried something new this year. Back around the holidays, uh, we issued something that we called a notice of intent for uh, a potential funding opportunity. Uh, and the category was aggregate purchasing. I mean, through forums like this and all, we've heard in the past that one of the, one of the challenges uh, that we need to try to work on to get the price down for these alternative fuels vehicles <laughs> was we had to get the volumes up so that the manufacturers could get the price down. It, it couldn't be just, you know, onesie, twosie vehicles and everybody ordering something special. How could we really aggregate those purchases, either get the niches that we were discovering today to, to get their act together so that they're ordering it more in bulk, or maybe they're timing their ordering at the same time that matches the manufacturer's windows of when they actually uh, make these things on the assembly line. So the notice of intent in, around the holidays was we're thinking about doing something like that. We've never done that kind of a funding opportunity before. Um, so get to, uh, you know, tell us what you think. And uh, we did get good feedback from that, and people said, I'm, I'm you know, excited about that. And there were a number of organizations that came up, so uh, we, uh, we're really poised to respond when that comes out. So what we've actually done that is a second step, and what we're just announced within the last few hours, and it's posted on our website on the financial opportunities, is sort of the next step in that. We, we're doing what we call a request for information, an RFI on that same subject. In other words, it's a chance for you to give us more information. We've actually got a list of questions of things that we'd like to learn a little bit more about that particular topic before that we put the funding opportunity out there. It's a chance for you to help us fine tune what that funding opportunity might be so that we're focusing in, in, in a good area. We're admitting we're not the experts on aggregate purchasing or we probably would have tried to solve that a long time ago. Uh, so please take a look at, it's at our, where you'd normally look at our website under the financial opportunities uh, and drill down that, on that and you've got some time to submit your, uh, your answers to the questions or other information that you'd like to provide that will help us again focus in uh, on that funding opportunity that hopefully we'll be able to do uh, later in the spring then. So uh, that's the big announcement. I'm sorry it wasn't the actual awards today, but uh, <laughs> we're kind of excited to see how this process works. Because again, you've asked us, how can we have more input into the funding opportunities to help fine tune them to, to really serve the needs the best. So we're going to see how it works on this process and hopefully uh, it'll be something we can use even in the future then. Uh, Linda, was there anything else to wrap up? So, I mean, this, uh, this concludes the official ceremonies here. We're, uh, some of us are going to hang around, answer questions. Uh, we're so, so pleased that you came today and participated and hung with us all day long. This information it, is so important to us. And we'll be, uh, as described earlier, we'll be uh, giving you the opportunity to, to give us more feedback in writing over the next few weeks. Uh, and, and it will be definitely listened to and included in the, the strategic plan going forward. So thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.